Our talk today, our podcast today, has an unusual title in the sense that it doesn't represent our point of view. It's called Words Don't Matter, but words matter a lot to us. Um, and when I say words don't matter, what I'm commenting on is the state of intellectual discourse. I'm going to review a number of thinkers and talkers many of whom have said things consistent with us, but, and uh, many of whom have a wide reach, and yet their views have had no impact and were completely submerged. Their words didn't matter. And some of the people I'm going to mention are David Brooks, Sally Sattel, Ethan Adelman, Corin Zelkis, T. Kira Madden, William Styron, and Maya Salovitz. <clears throat> So let me just begin with a little story outside of school. Um, when uh, Sally Sattel and Scott Lilienfeld wrote um, Brainwash, brilliant book, um, David Brooks, famous conservative columnist for the New York Times, interviewed them at the American Enterprise Institute. And in the course, and the book is about how um, the concept of addiction has been overstated in terms of its concrete representation in the brain. Mm -hmm. And in the course of the interview, David Brooks at one point lets slip, of course, people never get over addiction. And Sally in about, Sally Sattel in about 10 seconds said, well, that's not true. The majority do. And then the talk went on. If you interview David Brooks tomorrow, what do you think his opinion is about the changeability of addiction? I don't think Sally swayed his opinion out too much. That was, like a, that was like a blip in the continuity of the conversation for him. And that is so fundamental, that idea. And so we could ask the question, you know, and reflect on, well, why wouldn't Sally stretch that out and you know i'm not uh the speech was that the talk was at the american enterprise institute it was well received wide audience and that teachable moment disappeared like a you know a pebble in the sand and i'm never going to get invited to speak to the american enterprise institute. i did get invited as a part of a panel to speak at cato but it's just not the same thing how would I have dealt with that? I don't think you could have let that go, but probably would have asked some sort of uh, basic questions about David Brooks' own life, what he's seen, who he the knows. First thing I would say That's to what David I would do. Is, you never heard of Vietnam, David? Yeah, yeah. And then I think the second thing I might have done is do my cigarette exercise. Like, say, what do people think is the hardest addiction, drug addiction to quit? People would all say smoking. And I say, oh, is anybody in this room quit smoking, and then, of course, a large majority have quit, and they've quit without any kind of therapy. David Brooks, by the way, does refer, David Brooks is anti-drug. Uh, he talked about a time in his life when he was young, when he smoked a lot of marijuana, and that was wrong. <clears throat> so I wanna jump, I mean, my point here is, Sally Zetel knows the truth, she spoke the truth, it had no impact. That gathering in David Brooks' mind are as unpolluted with the truth today, and that took place years and years ago. Um, David Brooks just wrote a column yesterday, and the column was called, You Are Not Who You Think You Are. Huh. The categories we use to describe our thinking are messed up. Wow. He, David Brooks prides himself in being tuned into all modern kinds of research, including neuroscience. And he reviews a number of neuroscience studies. And here's the final paragraph. For a while, neuroscientists spent a lot of time trying to figure out what region of the brain did what function. I've been writing against that, you know, since I wrote an article in 1990 in the Atlantic about a gene for alcoholism that doesn't exist. Quote, we're back to David Brooks. Fear is in the 
amygdala. In other words, like mapping the brain, look at the genes and the neuroscience and you'll know exactly where addiction is. <clears throat> Today, they also look at the ways vast networks across the brain, body and environment work together to create comprehensive mental states. That's a pretty pregnant sentence. <clears throat> well, they're parts of the brain, they communicate with each other and they in interact with the environment and then something comes out. Okay. And here's his last sentence. Now there is much more emphasis on how people and groups creatively construct their own realities and live within their own constructions. Wow. After all that, dare I say it, bullshit about neuroscience, he makes a statement which is so fundamental and powerful. People and groups create their own social constructs and they live within that reality. And he had to review the neuroscience research to get to that point. And I wanna make a quick reference now, Net, uh, since we've spoken about uh, how we got into the Afghanistan situation, Netflix, uh, among others, did a five point, doc, uh, doc, five point documentary called Turning Point, 9-11 and the War on Terror. In the fourth episode, they interviewed a woman officer and she said this, when I was in the United States, I had a reality about the United States. I knew what the United States was and everybody I knew agreed with me. And when I got to Afghanistan, that reality didn't exist. The Afghans didn't accept that reality. Mm -hmm. And that was a pretty critical point for the fact that there was large scale, for example, Afghan soldiers on our side would murder our own officers, they couldn't fight together. So that fundamental discrepancy, the difference between the reality she came to Afghanistan with and the reality on the road was a part of the 2 trillion 20 year losses that we suffered. Realities are in people's social groups and minds. I want to turn now to a bunch of thinkers and writers. I'm going to talk about a book, Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls, a memoir <laughs> by T. Kira Madden. Her father, by the way, before we get into it, was associated with, I forget what his name is, Jordan something, the guy that inspired her, wrote the movie uh, Wolf of Wall Street and wrote that book, Wolf of Wall Street. I, <clears throat> yeah. That's all I know about her, really. Her uncle... She, I'm a, she, it's hard to put her in a category, T.K. Romano. Mm -hmm. Her family's beyond wealthy. Um, I think it was her uncle, possibly. I think it was both. Her uncle and her father, I think both spent time in federal penitentiaries. They're part of a, this is beyond my ken, they're an international shoe conglomerate that makes beyond billions. Mm -hmm. And somehow, they went to federal penitentiary for some kind of, they didn't do, they did something wrong. Mm. Um, so NPR interviewed her and they did a review of the book. Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls is compassionate without being apologetic. Sometimes the memoir is focusing on growing up addiction. Oh, both of her parents kind of died of addiction. Her mother was Chinese Hawaiian and her main thing was a pill problem, but, and her father's main thing was alcohol, but they mixed and matched. So not, and she took a lot of drugs, she Kieran Madden. And now she's, I think around 41-ish and she's not a drug addict and she's not in recovery. Sometimes the memoir is focusing on growing up, addiction, sexuality, and their attendant traumas end up with trajectories that lead to some sort of overcoming. At the end, the author ties them up neatly with a bright pink bow of recovery or healing. Readers searching for this kind of redemptive story may not like Tiki Ramadan's memoir, Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls. But the other readers, the ones who value seeing the mess that is childhood, the volatility of desire, the madness of girlhood and what is expected of it, they may well wear out the book's covers with fervid 
reread it. So Keith Kiramadden had a traumatic childhood. She took a lot of drugs and alcohol. Her parents kind of died of addiction, but the book is sort of not about that. It's about at the person she is now looking back on those experiences. I'm reading from the review again. While Madden's father and his death are all over the book, there is a tenderness reserved for a mother that culminates in the long final chapter titled Kuliana. The Hawaiian word translates more or less to responsibility, but is more like a great sacred duty. And in this final section, Madden tells portions of her mother's story as a child raised in Hawaii and Florida and the repercussions that ripple forward in time from events in which control and agency were taken away from her. So in her old, her, her maturity, she looks back on her mother to understand her mother. I mean, she, she could be as pissed off at her mother and father. And she, throughout the book, she says she loves her father. She could be as pissed off at them as possible. But that's not what the book's about. In bearing the bad and ugly alongside the good, Madness succeeded in creating a mirror of larger concerns even as her own story is achingly specific and personal. And then there's, th that was written by Alana Massad. I don't know who she is. She wrote the review and interviewed her. And the book, in the discussion, uh, Madden says her mother's so present in her life, she's still trying to grapple with her father, coming to grips with the unresolved aspects of it. And Timira, Madden, Kira Madden became well known as a writer before writing this book because she detailed a sexual assault she suffered as a middle school kid. And she, she wonders if I had opened up about the sexual assault to my father, how would that have affected our relationship? Could he have helped me? Would it have been a better relationship? That's, we'll never know that. <clears throat> And the interviewer goes, your dad was there, but absent. And then Shakira, T. Kira Madden says, people are trying to do their best. Very profound statement. Both her parents and she and the other fatherless girls are trying to do their best. They're all trying to get by in reality in their situations. So the perpetrator of the sexual assault on her, who at the time was a kid, kept trying to contact her for a period of 17 years. And Tiki Raman began to view that as sort of, it's to call it a sexual assault would be wrong, a kind of harassment, a stalking. Mm -hmm. And she refused to talk to him. His life went completely, he, he's dead and he went to prison for other, you know, his life was a wreck. <clears throat> The perpetrator reached out to me and after the death of my father, I accepted 17 years later. And the interviewer says, do you think it was helpful? If you read the book, she didn't think it was helpful. No. She felt she was being harassed anew. And she begins her response by saying, people keep saying that must have been freeing. And that's the kind of, that's the philosophy of Gabor Mate and others. Well, let's uncover and resume and return to your trauma? And her answer was, it wasn't. Ultimately, I opened up something I had resolved. I had worked through it. I shouldn't have revisited it. So she reopened up that can instead of living the life that she had grown accustomed to living, which is basically happy and good and flourishing. And she's now, I think, around 41. She has a partner. I think she, she's married, I think. Um, she's okay. She's a writer. She's thinking about her parents. Those are important thoughts for her. And she's not thinking about her sexual assault perpetrator or reconvening with him or finding out his ex explanation. That's, that's going by the board. She's beyond that. So keep in mind Tiki Ramadan's story. Uh, we've mentioned Corin's sale kiss before. Mm -hmm. I'm going to return to it. We didn't give it possibly as full credit as we did. Corin Zelkis wrote a book called Smash, Story of a Drunken Girlhood. Um, that was published in 
2005, when she was 25, obviously she had gotten out of college. And in 2008, she married Eamon Hamilton, the singer and a songwriter. So she's gotten out of college and she was drunk throughout college and high school. She had blackouts and was hospitalized. And why did she write the book? She wrote the book because, this is quoting, Zalkis did not agree with the psychologists and the sociologists who said, girls today are drinking more because they're just so damn liberated because they're bursting with confidence and girl power because they believe they can match boys everywhere, including the bar. In her own experience, Zelkis says, she and her female friends drank largely because of an expression of their unhappiness and lack of confidence. She decided to write the book when she was 23 because it occurred to Zelkis she could offer a different perspective. So Zelkis is kind of a radical and a revolutionary in thinking about addiction. She's not thinking of it as like something that results from using substances. She's thinking that it results from the emotions of the people consuming it. And that motivated her to write the book. And now, by the time she'd written the book, she wasn't drinking anymore. She was married or she wasn't married yet, but she was in a relationship and she was writing. Zelkis has been challenged by some readers who want to dispute her assertion that she is not an alcoholic. In interviews, Zelkis maintains, quote, I've talked to a lot of addiction counselors who say alcohol is made up of two things, abuse and addiction. God knows I had the abuse down pat, but I don't know that I necessarily felt or feel that addiction. And so now I don't identify myself as an alcoholic. I think the way we would put that is, well, she didn't have an alcoholic identity. She knew she was drinking constantly. And those two things don't go together for mm -hmm. her. That identity didn't feel true to me, so I didn't write it. I also think the brand alcoholic prevents a lot of people, especially young people, from seeking help or even reevaluating the relationship with alcohol. Mm -hmm. Reevaluating the relationship with alcohol. So but you can do that? Entirely different message. Yeah. And going back to T. Kira Madden, people won't let her say her message. In my mind, the whole point of Smashed is to say that you don't have to be a quote-unquote alcoholic in order to examine the underlying reasons why you're drinking. She wrote a be gigantic bestseller, and that bestseller was transformed into a platform for expressing virtually the opposite of what she believed and what she wrote the book mm -hmm. for. Uh, now I'm going to get into a world-class case of how a story gets reinterpreted in a way that makes it the opposite of what it tells. And I'm going to mention another of our colleagues. You have interviewed Sally Sattel. I've known Sally a long time, admire her tremendously. Maya Salovitz is somebody who's written about depression in relationship to addiction. She wrote about um, William Stein's book, um, William Stein's book was called- uh, Darkness Visible. And it was considered a landmark book about expressing the disease of depression. There are two main things in the book. And, and in every interview that um, Styron has given after that, that he talks about constantly, God bless Maya, when I talked to her, she claimed not to know either of these two things. Why wouldn't my, why does a careful, brilliant woman like Maya not know two principal things in the book that William Styron constantly reiterated. Why do you imagine? I haven't told you what the two things are. What do you imagine she doesn't know what those two things are? Well, this isn't specific to Maya. Anybody who does writing research or has a um, platform that people are accustomed to listening to her, I mean, it's, a, it's just a confirmation bias. I mean, you're just going to funnel into things that match your story that you need to, need to be able to tell. And you're going to leave behind the parts that are inconvenient. And these are pretty big points that are inconvenient. 
I mean, Amaya Salovitz's basic model of addiction is addiction's not a primary disease. She was depressed and anxious. That caused her to become addicted to drugs. And medications work to cure those things. That's her story. Um, and here's William Styron's story. Um, Dark, uh, Darkness Visible was written in 1988, but William and Rose Styron, Rose's his wife, were interviewed in 2001 by a, a, at a website called Families for Depression Awareness, which is a disease group. William Styron was always being paraded in front of the disease groups. Hmm. <clears throat> When I first experienced depression in June of 1985, the depression was very gradual. It didn't pounce on me in any immediate way. I was not an alcoholic, but I found that alcohol was losing its magical effect and that I had a revulsion for it. So I stopped drinking. I think it may have been a withdrawal from alcohol that helped precipitate this depression. I thought that instead of suffering from depression, I was suffering from alcohol withdrawal. So, Factually, why does he say alcohol worked for him? While he was drinking, he was okay. Mm -hmm. He didn't quit drinking because he went into recovery. He quit drinking because alcohol didn't agree with him anymore. He was getting older. And then he went entered a deep depression. Now, Maya is a great believer in harm reduction, but she's a believer in treating the problem with medication. Uh, mm. I herself drinks alcohol now. Mm -hmm. Get a heroin and cocaine uh, monkey. <clears throat> you know, we could. Do you think if uh, Maya took heroin today, she'd become re addicted? And Absolutely not. She thinks so. I, so yeah. her that's her truth. But, but it's, I, don't I don't think so. That Maya's going to take heroin and cocaine, which is, God bless her, yeah. her right yeah. as a human being. <laughs> But this story doesn't work for my alcohol mm -hmm. worked for him. He stopped drinking. So now I want, there's a man that you and I have kind of communicated with. You may interview him or may not. Benya Clark, ben, Benya Clark writes about sobriety and medium. And he wrote a, 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 pod, a blog post, The Hard Parts of Being Sober. Mental health. When I quit drinking, my depression and anxiety skyrocketed. I seriously struggled with my mental health for quite a while. My first year sober was very dark. I've gradually gotten better over the years, but even now I still sometimes have trouble. Now this is a guy, he's writing a column on sobriety. He got 500 applauses and I wrote a comment. What does that paragraph say? That was your comment? What's that? That was your comment to him? What does that paragraph um, say? I wrote what I think it says. Oh. Oh, well, I, I wrote, well, may, I can't remember. Well. You, you asked, I, I remember sort of, I just don't remember exactly. You asked a reflective question about what this means to him right. about sobriety nobody he he stopped drinking and he entered a plummeting year of depression and years later he still experiences mental and emotional turmoil now as a, as a clinician as a coach how do you react to that this is in a column about sobriety and not one person mentions it He's saying that he was happier and mentally healthier when he was drinking. So what's harm reduction mean? Harm reduction means if you're using a substance in a way that's constructive for your mental health, that's a plus. Sobriety and recovery can't possibly mean that you enter a tailspin of emotional despair. That can't be what but not one reader said, huh, this is a little bit of an argument against sobriety. And let's just say, um, 
let's give the devil his due. Maybe he wasn't happier. I, logically speaking, he's, he's sort of saying I was happier when I was drinking because he says when I quit drinking, that's when my anxiety depression skyrocketed. Um, but you take all of his blogs into one and you could say he knew there was something not sustainable. He wasn't feeling great when he was drinking too much and they knew there was not so, there was something not sustainable about it. It's just that his um, his revelation about sobriety. If you were it's, 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 and somebody said, well, I'm not happy about the way I'm drinking, the amount I'm drinking, you would nod your head. Uh, and then when he said, and when I stopped drinking, it sounds like he was almost suicidal. Let me say that if I was sobriety's attorney right now, I would need to bring in a very good character witness. You know, it's not a good case for him. It's there's something missing, at least. That's the you know, people are not. Is, uh, I mean, he mentions it almost as well. This is one of the problems. People are not going to quit doing something if they're going to become suicidal and depressed for years. Right, right. I'm going to go back to Styron now and thinking of Maya, who we both admire. Styron got treated in 19, he, um, well, the book Darkness Visible was published in 1988. He was in real need of medical help, but unfortunately we didn't get the right medical help. Huh. How, how do you know how to get the right medical help? Right. William Styron has a little more going on than most people it's They're always post yeah, yeah it's always post hoc whether someone did or didn't get the right medical help there's no one ever saying this is the right medical help and right yeah. and he would have who would i mean a, a man at the top of the intellectual elite in new york city you would think mm. would get a good reference yeah he was in real need of you know, medical help but unfortunately we didn't get the right medical help we found a doctor who identified depression which in one way was a relief but the care was not what it should have been. The doctor was so worried that Bill was well known and that this incident would stigmatize him or cause some kind of public crisis. He kept telling me to give him higher and higher doses of one of several medications and to keep him at home, not to let him get out of my sight. In 1988, he, uh, William Styron wrote a big major op-ed piece for the New York Times. And it was his book came out, and uh, at the same time, a man named Primo Levi committed suicide. Buried in that article is this sentence. And the presence are, to put it generously, unreliable. So millions of people read that. And what, what are they selling? They're selling... Um, addiction as a medical treatment, as a medical disease that doctors know how to treat. I'm gonna jump ahead in 2018, the 30th anniversary of Styron's book, the New York Times op-ed published uh, a podcast on Styron, The Great God of Depression. Science journalist, Pagan Kennedy from the New York Times gives the standard assessment. Mr. Quote, Mr. Styron helped to popularize a new way of looking at the brain and his telling Suicidal depression is a physical ailment. The book includes a cursory discussion of the chemistry of the brain, neurotransmitters, serotonin, and so forth. For many years, readers, it was the first introduction to scientific ideas that are now widely accepted. So, and Styron did do that. He talked about it as being a disease. And unfortunately, they didn't know how to treat it, which is not good news, and was constantly being suppressed, but didn't need to be suppressed. He would speak about it and people would ignore it, God bless her, including Maya Salovitz. He became re-depressed, William Styron later in life. This interview took place in 2001. Last year, the summer of 2000, I was once again beset by this illness. Rose, his wife, it's always good to have an independent observer. After he had a bad allergic reaction to one medication, he wanted to try a different treatment. So, you know, they're selling the idea that they have a disease they know how to treat. And now he's now, he's been being treated now for 15 years and he had a bad reaction to medication and they had to hospitalize him. Mm. So he went to the hospital, but the treatment itself 
was initially disastrous. It made him go further and further downhill, not only mentally, but also diminishing the physical health he once had. So this is a recommendation. The, they're saying this in 2001. In 2018, the New York Times writes an op-ed about well, the William Styron experience about how it's now accepted that a depression is a medical disease that we know how to treat. And his wife is saying after 15 years, there was the first bad treatment. He was dying from the treatment. I mean, and he was depressed before, but now he's physically deteriorating. I watched him become depleted, tentative, and finally lose 50 pounds. He refused to eat and had all kinds of psychoses, which changed day by day. The psychoses had little germ in reality, but then became 99% fantasy. Physically and mentally, he deteriorated at such an alarming rate that it didn't look like he was going to recover. I think they mean survive. So this interview was given in 2001, and in 2018, the New York Times could say, well, it's now well known, depression's a medical disease that can be treated successfully. And William Styron went through the end of his life deeply depressed and rejecting having suffered primarily, he says, and his wife Rose say, from the treatment they received. It's a non-conversation. If you don't get treatment, you should have gotten treatment. If you get treatment and die, you didn't get a good doctor. And there's nothing, what's to talk about? They ran all over his life. They reinterpreted his life to fit a current paradigm. The paradigm can't be challenged. He and he's used, he's cited through the podcast in the Times and the op-ed as the model example, and I, I think Maya would as well, of how it, depression is a dis treatable disease. And, and Maya is all for drugs for treating depression and anxiety. She feels they're successful. Perhaps they weren't successful for William Styron. This is not a good advertisement, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what Corin Zalkis says. It doesn't matter what T. Kira Madden says. It certainly doesn't matter what Sally Sattel says. There's a prevailing reality that cannot be reversed. That reality is a social reality and let's just go back to um, David Brooks. Now there is much more emphasis on how people in groups creatively construct their own realities and live within their constructions. So we live in a constructed reality about addiction, which David Brooks believes. We live in a creative uh, destruction, a cre a destructive creative reality about depression and its treatment. Depression isn't declining in America. It hasn't declined since 19, it's increased since 1990. And suicides have increased since 1990 when William Styron was diagnosed. <clears throat> and yet we're, drug deaths have increased since 1990s. We're willing to submit ourselves to these socially constructed realities despite the self-evident evidence that they're failing us, the testimony of key people that they don't work for them and that some of them, like Corin Zelkis and T. Kira Madden have found superior approaches in their own lives and we refuse to hear them. This is what I think sometimes you, uh, you worry about me getting too chummy with people who are fundamentally wrong. Because, um, well, I won't speak for you. I shouldn't have said that part, but I just, no one, there's no. this, there's a sort of postmodern vibe that you can get. Like I hear this all the time. Well, you know, you have your opinion. I have my opinion. None of them are wrong. It's just, you know, we're just all of our opinions and um, that's fine. That sounds nice, but, but having 
that sort of a mentality, that sort of a postmodern sense of this just, you know, there's no right story. The stories that we tell are just the ones that we tell well, that's like, as, uh, a, as a greater yeah, body count. We don't believe the mate. We're not matrix people. We yeah. don't believe that there are alternative constructive realities. Right. And one and one and dying is a big reality. Yeah. And that's what I mean. That that sort of thinking has a greater body count. I mean, that's just at the end of the day, that seems to be like whatever metric you're going for in terms of improving things or people, death is usually not where you're going. I mean, but they're going beyond that. They're they're not saying, okay, everybody can have their own reality. They're rejecting. Corinne Elkins is attacked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because she's saying, well, I'm not an alcoholic. And the reviewer, very insightful reviewer said, well, people aren't going to like T. Kira Madden's book if they're into recovery and trauma as the cause of your mental state. That's not what her book's about. That is sort of a paradox of that way of thinking, I've noticed, is that every time you say, well, everyone can have their own reality, you, what, there wind up being these people, or maybe it's the person saying everyone can have their own reality, who says, um, and that's why this person just doesn't get it. You know, everyone has their own reality, but I'm sort of on the outside looking in and I know better. That's all. That's always the bottom line of that way of thinking. And, and they know, I mean, not one commentator on um, Benya Clark's, not one. No, they're such a collective herd going over a cliff. Not one said, gosh, you got suicidal and depressed and anxious for years is po is sobriety sobriety means total abstinence is there possibly some alternative that you might have considered because that's a that's not a casual incident that's a steep price there's a herd mentality we haven't got to herd you herd mentality unity yeah. yet but the herd mentality means everybody rushes off the cliffs together yeah. you're not allowed to question that reality if you question that reality You'll be attacked, I, right. you know, or at, you'll, they won't generally bother to attack you. They'll just ignore you. Nobody will remember that Sally Sattel said that most people got over addiction. Mm -hmm. Nobody's going to subtle, you know, people are still coming up to Kikir and Madden and saying, oh, it must have been such a great relief to confront your abuser, your, the man who sexually assaulted you. And people are still saying, oh, for God, it's so great that darkness visible revealed the disease nature of depression that we can now treat so successfully. <clears throat> People can't even take in that reality. There's always <laughs> a way to slip out of base reality. Um, Benya Clark, I think, is a good example. He seems like a really nice guy, by the way. She's I mean, the like commentary that he wrote, I mean, he said, you said something that he either disagreed with or he just felt He's like, oh, that hurt. You know, I, I like this. I like this Peel guy, and I've cited him, and uh, I hate to hear him speaking out against me. And it was fair, you know. It just, I don't didn't agree with it, but it was, uh, it was kind. He seems nice, but what is he? Is he a uh, an entertainment kind of a blogger, or is he a I guru think that, of? I, no, I know, I know. It's he sort of a law school when he quit drinking. Yeah, he's not a lawyer. I'm not 100% sure what he does now. But this is sort of a rhetorical question. I just mean, he can be a purveyor of truth role. But it, then again, if you attack his point of view or say that uh, these things you're saying can't be true, well, your push, the pushback against you is, why are you attacking this blogger? He's just talking about his life. And uh, I don't know that he means to do that or means to have he a He actually sort of defended me. Yeah, yeah. Because every all the comments about this is a previous comment I made, a bunch of people attacked me, and he said, "Well, you know, I respect him, and I respect that he has his point of view." So, you you've talked about actually interviewing him, and yeah, but she agreed, did agree to do. I, I can't. Said, I, I think he said, but you know, maybe he won't do it eventually. You've interviewed Sally Sattel, and you've interviewed. Uh, uh, Maya Salovitz, and you know, you confront the situation. I mean, how much are people willing to confront these situations? Now, I'm on one end of the spectrum. Um, um, David Brooks would never 
invite me to interview him. <laughs> I mean, already, if I say to him, David, you haven't heard about Vietnam? He doesn't want that kind of bullshit. Why, why would he put himself up for that? And I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my Ethan invitation now. So hold on. Stan, and why do you want to go around and make yourself unpopular? and disagree with people and attack them. So what's my answer in this, in the David Brooks situation? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the truth is important to you. I and mean, it's, if you can get, that's not a throwaway line, you know, saying, well, nobody comes away from addiction. It, people are addicted forever. I mean, that's just, I know that it's important to you to stop that conversation there and get to the bottom of what the hell that statement is about. How deeply does he believe that? You know, There's to what extent does it fall apart? Having, Sally's written a book questioning conventional wisdom about addiction. Right. He's got a wide audience. They're supposedly coming to grips with what addiction is. So if you play to a format, then you are really, I mean, the format is the authority. Right. So that's the way of putting it. You, you kind of have to break it in order to make a decent point. I, this was, um, I, I, I've seen the video. Uh, uh, this is before podcasts, I think, or maybe not. Um, I've seen the video. It went out in the world. It's a product. There's an audience. The audience has an expectation, and everybody goes along with that. By the way, Scott Lilienfeld, at one point, <laughs> invited me to Emory University Medical School, where he was associated. And this was in the late 90s after um, Addiction is a Brain Disease by Leshner had been published in Science. And he had me in a small seminar with some leading thinkers in the, in the, at the university. And I said, well, I want to retitle my talk today. I want to tell you, um, Alan Leshner is full of shit. That's the title <laughs> of my talk. You know, and this is, they're all senior faculty members. You know, I, I wanted to smack them upside the head. I, I, you know, I never talked to Scott after that. I, I, he might have thought, huh, but you know, of course, I couldn't penetrate their brains one way or another. And Scott Lillingfeld more or less thinks the way I did. He was bringing me in in a way, I mean, he, he had respectful involvement in the, he's a faculty member, he was, he's dead, faculty member there. You know, they all liked each other. He has a job for God's sake. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you might say, what did you expect when you brought Stanton in? And I never really asked him, well, what, what do you think my impact was? But people tend to say, well, Stan, and you can't just go and, you know, tell people that they're full of shit, you know, and expect them to listen to you. On the other hand, you can't just give a 10 second throwaway line with, like Sally Sattel did and expect people to change their things. So my concept, my approach, I, I wrote a memoir, um, A Scientific Life on the Edge, My Lonely Quest to Change How We See Addiction, and I bring up the issue, what about my approach? It hasn't won yet, but you know, people who think like me haven't won yet. And um, you know, I am willing to torch the place to kind of, uh, there's a common, um, one of my favorite people in the world is named Franca Beccaria. I love Franca. She's Italian. She lives in Turin and she, um, among the controversies in the book, um, I emailed Franca behind the scenes. There's a Kettlebrun list. Kettlebrun is the World Epidemiology, Social Epidemi Alcohol Epidemiology Society. And Franca said, you know, they don't pay attention to us Southern Europeans. It's totally dominated by English and Scandinavian. Mm -hmm. And I said, why don't you write that to the list? And she did. And within a couple of years, they made a president of the Kettle Brune Society for two years. She's a brilliant woman. 
And she has great people skills, but they didn't change their views one iota about alcohol being a dangerous thing. She comes from a Southern European culture where she joined me in presenting the idea of socializing alcohol as a positive experience. In some ways, she's more militant about it than I was. Well, more ironclad about it. And the research she published said things like that. For example, um, in, in regions in Italy that produce the most wine, they had the fewest drinking problems. And her argument would be, well, they're feeling that they can control that process. We traveled to one of those areas uh, where her husband was from, and they took me around showing how beautifully the wine, grape vines were planted. And there were filling stations where people would come with containers and they would fill them with wine. Wine was a completely natural part of their experience. And so um, Franga, I would say had no impact whatsoever. Um, she shared my views. She presented them in a, uh, she wasn't a uh, obstreper. Well, we gave presentations together. And if you read my memoir, um, the, the funniest part of the memoir is Franca, I have people at the end of the book recalling their interactions with me. And Franca said this, she wrote it in 2020. We did a, pre a presentation together and she said, Stanton Peel came to our presentation and lit the gasoline on fire. To this day, 10 years later, people come up to me in the streets of Turin or Rome, wherever I'm traveling, and they say, do you remember that presentation that you gave with Stanton Peel? So, and when she says that, I know she smiles. So, at least they remember it. Yeah, that's impactful. That's true. I go, I go through that, uh, play that game on a smaller scale all the time. I mean, I'm just the to the people's eyes who play by the rules of the system and never question. I'm the most bizarre little critter that they've ever encountered. Um, but obviously, I'm not an idiot, and obviously, I do things well and. I ask questions that make people go, oh, what? Well, don't, you're not supposed to say that. Um, but I try to be generous wherever I go, you know, really try go out of my way to let people know that I'm listening. I respect them. Even if they know I couldn't agree, possibly agree less, I I'll listen to you for an hour. That's sort of what podcasting's about for me. I don't think either of us have totally cracked the code, Stanton, but uh, it's, it's somewhere in that happy middle. Coaching. If somebody comes, well, we have a coaching site that says we're not the 12 step approach. Mm -hmm. So if somebody comes in, we don't argue with them about whether they have a disease or not. We bypass that discussion. And your, your, your job is not to confront, certainly not to attack. Um, but it's not to confront people. But you can imagine, I'll make up a client, somebody coming to you and talking about their depression, how it's a disease. Right. And we're not really treating depression. We're treating, they've come with some substance or some other identified addiction type problem. But um, your way of dealing with that is, isn't to attack people. But, but our whole approach is to do this. And, and trauma is another issue that we brought up in, in charge of Tiki Um We would say if, if somebody wants to talk about their disease or their trauma, here are the three characteristics of the life process program, coaching program. We're uh, strength-based. We're forward-looking and we're solution-oriented. So those things are the opposite and we're, and, and we're I'll throw another one in, we're anti-labeling. Mm. So Timir, Kira Madden and Corin Zalkis 
are practicing in their own way our approach through their own natural lives. They're agents of our point of view. And they're both fabulously well known. So we're glad they're out there and we hope they continue to spread the word. Another question for you. So well, I was actually talking about my work in a school system, but you mentioned sort of a clinical role. Why don't you think, or do you think that those clinical conversations, totally non-judgmental, but still interrogating ideas or why people hold their ideas or, or if they're ever holding to incompatible beliefs. I mean, I, I don't, a client at the end of the day, it's not really a success if the client feels like, who's this asshole? Um, so you, why doesn't that scale? I mean, it seems like you with a, a single person coming to you for help, you would do that. You would be that sort of a clinician. Like, I'm not going to judge you. Um, let's just talk about it. Let's talk about what your ideas are. Let me ask you some questions. You're more... Uh, yeah, the more... <clears throat> you work in a system, and you work in more than one system. And people respect you and see the success of your work. And they follow your lead in approaching problems with, say, a student. And you're kind of basic, you, you're a nitty gritty guy, you avoid labels and you say things, stupid things like, well, why don't we ask the student what's going on? And of course they've come in with a report and the report has all kinds of neurological stuff in it. And you, you say, all right, all right, why don't we just ask the student what's going on and try and deal Remember David Brooks and remember that woman uh, coming back from Afghanistan? You try and deal with their reality. And people kind of say, all right, let's let him do that. You know, we've hired him and he does a good job. Everybody respects you and they know you do a good job. So why doesn't, the question becomes, why doesn't it even scale within your own organization? Yeah, that is that was my original question. That This is the subsequent, I'm trying to reframe it in a different way. So what I was saying is I don't think I've cracked the code and it doesn't scale. I'm trying to make sense of that. And I thought maybe you would have some. I so if you're the answer to it and people would say, <clears throat> I mean, forgive me for channeling Ethan. It's totally unfair. <laughs> and then why can't you be nice like Zach? Yeah, maybe you could hold a job and be popular. Mm. And you and I are both asking the question, well, we have two pretty different personalities and approaches. We have different careers. I mean, you have a job for God's sake. I've barely ever had a job and neither of us has cracked the code except for a couple of individuals. And, you know, David Brooks is sort of giving at all a necessary neuroscientific basis for saying uh, a social reality exists that people are never going to reject or quit or violate. All those Northern Europeans think something about alcohol. Um, Franca Beccari is not going to convince them otherwise and, and say, well, look, you know, I've been drinking wine since I was a child. Mm -hmm. um, and the outcomes for alcohol, they, when they do research, uh, the outcomes for social misbehavior when drinking and even cirrhosis of the liver are infinitely better than Northern Europe. But they're still going to prevail. They're still going to pre pre pervade and present um, their anti-alcohol point of view. They're just going to do it, and nobody's nicer than Ranga Bakaria. And she can be. She can be pretty forceful in presentations. At the same time, that she's a lovely person. Everybody likes. So, so far, our answer is. It's impossible to crack the social reality uh, concept of the social concept of what a reality is around things that are so fluid as uh, addiction issues. And I'd say you and I are both pretty ambitious. I mean, you'd say you never really held a job long term. I always feel like I'm both on, on my way to, uh, like I'm about to be fired or I'm about to be promoted. I can't ever quite tell. 
Uh, it's it's like an exhausting oh, experience. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> so you Should know, we promote Zach and you know give him a larger role in the school educational system. Or should we fire him? Do you know some of the things he tells the students? And yeah, right. right. Drugs. And, uh, well, you know, you're less than half my age, so per, you know, perhaps you'll find a happy medium. Although, you know, your career stretches out ahead of you. We're going to have to be negotiating these things. I've gotten my book, uh, a scientific life on the edge is my struggle to do that. And, you know, I'm betting somewhere down the road, you know, I saw a movie once where some totalitarian government had taken over and there was one guy who was a rebel and he finds an old library and he opens a book and he reads it. Mm -hmm. I'm just figuring that my point of view that, that I express in my memoir is a code that will be eventually translated or accepted somewhere further down the road after we go through a lot more turmoil. So your memoir is like a message in a bottle? Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. All right. Well, all right. We've had our little um, seance and um, we mentioned and profaned some great people, David Brooks, uh, people that we love, Ethan Dadelman, Maya Salovitz, Sally Sattel, uh, we've mentioned heroes of ours, uh, uh, Corin Zelkis and T. Mira Kira Madden. And we've mentioned somebody who was a bit of a pawn, you know, the author of Darkness Visible. His life didn't end well. So we've talked about the good, the bad, and the ugly. What else can we do? This is another Sunday. Au revoir. <laughs>